Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're ready to crank it back up. Just to give you an overview of uh, the rest of today's activities, um, we will go through the precursor, group one and two, uh, this morning. Each will provide a 15-minute uh, overview of their, of, of, of their uh, group's uh, products. And then each of you, or, or each, uh, you'll have 15 minutes for each one uh, to also go to the open microphones, because remember, again, we are web live streaming it uh, today. Uh, so um, please use the microphones. We'll have a 15 minute, minute period of, of discussion and dialogue for each. Then we'll uh, adjourn for lunch from 12 to uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. And then we'll reconvene and we'll go through each of the other groups in the same format and fashion, closing out uh, uh, at 4, uh, 4 to 4.30, we'll have a wrap-up. But, um, you know, one question that has come up uh, repeatedly is, geez, this is really uh, excellent information. Uh, how is this going to be, how, how is this going to be pulled together? And uh, so uh, in a couple of, couple of different ways. First off, uh, again, all the briefings are going to be on, on, our, on, our, on the website. Uh, number two, we are also pulling and compiling all the information. We have the scribes and the recorders, and we have the, the, the briefings and presentations. But we're also going to look at uh, compiling a report. Uh, we're going to, you know, have a top-level integrated section, leverage each of the... Uh, uh, the meaty content subsections for the sub teams as well as uh, a section for forward work. We'll also be tra uh, tracking uh, each of the detailed uh, pictures of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, brainstorming sessions. We'll also have the more detailed processes, the descriptions of the approaches, as well as uh, we hope to have concept maps. So I think we're going to cover the full spectrum of uh, capturing this uh, rich amount of content. And in that, in that vein, I want to applaud, I, uh, applaud all of you. I thought today's sessions were extremely productive. Not only were you able to focus on your specific area of expertise, but I thought the rich dialogue, the vigorous debate in some cases, was, was, uh, was wholly productive. And I think uh, um, we, I, I'm certainly looking forward to the outbreak. So with that, um, I, would like to, uh, I would like to bring up Sandy, uh, Jay first, Jay Jenkins, and then Sandy Magnus will come up. Um, each will each will go over the uh, the summary outcomes in their area uh, areas were uh, precursor precursor one and two. So, uh, without further ado, Jay. Okay, go ahead and say that. Okay, um, I'm really eager to see these charts about as much as you guys are. So let's go ahead and and, uh, and see what we got. Uh, next chart, please. Oh, uh, that's right. I got it here. Okay. Uh, lesson learned. Never schedule the outbrief in the same morning or afternoon as you've accumulated the data. <laughs> that all being said, uh, the questions that were before the robotic precursor mission uh, were actually about fivefold. Uh, but it really boils down to two main things. We were looking for what are the knowledge gaps that need to be filled in order to enable human exploration? And what are the measurements that would fill those knowledge gaps? Now the other parts of the question, of course, were the tie back to what are the human objectives. We wanted to make sure that we weren't doing precursor investigations that didn't precurse anything. There were measurements of their own right. We didn't want to do that. We wanted them to be tied to the human objectives. And we also did an assessment as to whether or not we believe that the measurements were critical or if they were important or just nice to have. We also did assessments as to whether or not these measurements would be considered to be engineering boundary condition type measurements, if they were hazard identification type measurements, if they were resource identification type measurements, or if they were measurements that would be used in the selection of targets. We also took a look at the time criticality of the measurements, characterizing it as early, middle, and late in five-year blocks, uh, before 2015, before 2020, or in the last five years ahead of 2025. So that all being said, the, the teams had a great deal of uh, vigorous conversation. They, I, I, we got a tremendous amount of fantastic data here. And so assimilating it uh, was uh, quite a, a hectic effort. But to walk through them, uh, knowledge gaps included uh, a survey 
to fill out the target list, the, the fundamental idea that, you know, do we have enough targets actually uh, to go and, and we need to flesh out that list in order to, or to be a precursor measurement or before um, we send uh, human beings uh, to the NEOs, we have to be able to have a list of targets for them to go to. So the measurements there uh, included the IR uh, survey map, which we heard several uh, presentations about yesterday, robust ground observations, photometry, imaging, um, and that perturb and poke, I think, is in the wrong one. Oh, okay, that one's, we, lines would have been good here. Okay, so the second one, uh, structural stability. Uh, local and regional stability of the surface. Uh, clearly that's uh, going to be required for understanding your engineering boundary conditions as well as hazards, as well as operations. And the types of things that you would get from that would be, that's where the photometry imaging, per, uh, perturbation and measuring, uh, poking, uh, shaking, uh, these are the types of measurements in order to determine that structural stability. Uh, the relationship between uh, distant and remote sensing and, and near-in sensing. Uh, basically, that's getting the IR spectra both in, in an in situ sense as well as in the IR survey sense and then cross correlating between the two. Electrostatic properties, we'd like, uh, in order to get that, we'd be flying a landing probe, light meter probe. Uh, toxicity was a knowledge gap, which of course uh, is a hazard identification. Uh, and so, what we'd be looking for there uh, is a sample return being the best way to handle that. Abrasive and corrosive uh, properties of the, of the regolith, uh, microscopic imagers, and uh, uh, me mechanism life tests uh, in an in situ situation. Uh, dust mechanical properties, sharpness function, size distribution, a thermal imager can, can uh, help identify those. Okay. Uh, dust levitation properties, a thermal imager would be useful for that particular measurement. Uh, responsive tissue to broad spectrum radiation, uh, that's something we've also identified with LRO and we're flying the crater instrument there and so we're, we'd be continuing that to uh, fly a tissue equivalent type detector. Surface chemistry, a uh, variety of instruments there, the alpha particle x-ray spectrometer, Mossbauer spec, uh, gamma ray broad spectrum sensor. Uh, spin state, uh, once again, critical both from a hazard standpoint, from an operation standpoint, uh, and, and from an engineering boundary condition standpoint, and clearly imaging is, is a pretty simple way to get the spin state. Characterization of the NEO population, uh, wide field ground-based telescope that's related to the other one. Once again, we combined uh, the results of uh, two tables here. Wobble, which I guess we get into more of a just a overall spin axis. Um, uh, characterization uh, that could also be uh, determined by imaging. Uh, radiative properties, total dose, once again, uh, we're looking at uh, neutron albedo, high energy particle spectrum, and I guess the tis uh, tissue uh, equivalent uh, instrument that was listed on the last page would also be appropriate. Orbital debris, high res, high -res imaging. Uh, structural integrity, uh, here's one of the more interesting ones that we get into and we address it a little bit more with uh, structural stability, but imaging, uh, ground penetrating radar, uh, contact probes, samples, uh, poke and pull tests, uh, penetra penetra there's another tough one. Uh, knowledge, uh, uh, porosity and mass distribution, so radio science, uh, Andy Chang had indicated that uh, use of that on NEAR was a, a valuable measurement in order to determine that. Measurements for ISRU, uh, basically uh, spectral imaging in, in various bands. Temporal changes over time. Telescopic measurements, I don't quite remember what that one's supposed to be. Uh, determining gravity model, uh, again, that's a duplicate, I guess. Uh, radio science. Um, ops and microgravity. Uh, here's where we get into some of the demonstrations. Uh, it's, we want to be sure that when the astronauts are going out to grapple, that the grappling measure, uh, instruments work, so we do have some uh, either technology demonstrations or the precursors to technology demonstrations doing the grappling measurements and mechanical properties and again that can be the poke and pull testing. Uh, proximity operations, maneuverability issues around the NEOs. Uh, the measurement basically is just doing it uh, and gaining the uh, con ops experience and the prox ops experience. And with that we'll go straight over to Sandy's presentation before engaging in the discussion. She had the exact same set of questions uh, and two more tables of input.
And as yesterday, we have some very similar um, conclusions. It's organized a little bit differently, and, and that might help uh, give a little bit of a twist to it. We had some very lively discussions. It was, it was really good. Go ahead and go. Oh, I was like, go to the next slide. I did the same thing, Jay. Um, we were able to categorize um, the numbers of the different knowledge for the different categories of the knowledge gaps we came up to. There, there was a lot of overlap, really, between engineering boundary conditions and, and hazards and engineering boundary conditions and resources. So these are a little bit squishy from a number viewpoint. But we ended up putting them into to various slides. Of course, the biggest uncertainty uh, is target selection. It was felt that we really don't have enough information even about the number of targets that are available to pick a target that we may want to go to. So the, the very first knowledge gap that you have to address is in the nature of your targets as far as um, identifying what potential targets you have in, in addition to once you find a, a series of targets that are of interest and in doing measurements of these very different uh, parameters here to identify which ones are really narrowing down to the one you want to send a human to. Um, there was also a lot of side discussion. We felt it was important to point out that uh, there was a filter, a series of filters that was used uh, to, were used to select what potential targets that we currently think we have, and there was some concern that perhaps we need to go back and look at what we used in parameters in the filters and, and think about that a little bit more to maybe expand the types of targets that we could potentially already know about um, with that set. In addition, it was uh, commented that any sort of measurements that you take with a precursor, precursor to fill the knowledge gaps, you definitely want to continue to do ground-based measurements from the earth to complement the set of measurements you're, you're planning to fill your knowledge gaps with on the precursor, and they should be used as a set to help in your target selection. Uh, a survey, uh, the types of measurements you can do from a survey was definitely something that came up as a requirement. You go to your your NEO with your precursor you have to, to fill in some of these knowledge gaps on the, the parameters of the measurement, uh, the parameters of the NEO, and you can do that with some kind of a survey with uh, radar imaging and IR, LIDAR, things like that. So, so there was sort of a general consensus that target selection and the types of measurements you need just to identify where to, uh, to send humans was an important thing to do first. Under hazards, and again, this was a lot of overlap between hazards, engineering, boundary conditions. Uh, of course, the humans, when they get there, are going to interact with the NEO in some form or fashion, and so you need to understand what the surface is about. Um, again, the, you know, do some penetration resistance. Well, you can read the list, the shear strength, things like this. So you're characterizing the surface in such a way that you know how the humans can react interact and what sort of tools that you can build for them to do that. And in addition, Jay already mentioned as far as, you know, EVA or what you're doing uh, with anchoring and, you know, throw a harpoon at it, put an auger into it and do these different kinds of things with the precursor so you can inform not only the operations but the design of the tools that you're going to use. Engineering boundary conditions, again, how are you designing the systems to the humans are going to use when they get to the planet or to the NEO. Uh, the internal structure you need to understand, you can do geophysics and radar uh, and density and porosity measurements. Is the thing going to break up when you touch it? Is it going to stay intact? Things like this. Uh, you need to measure with your precursor missions to fill in these kinds of, of knowledge gaps. The rendezvous and prox ops, uh, some also some knowledge uh, that you can gain from sending precursor there by doing some spin measurements and just some con ops is how you would do that. Um, again, the size, shape, composition. So there's a lot of overlap between these different areas. You basically just need to characterize the NEO so you know how the humans are going to interact with it once they get there. Resources, do you want to do some um, in situ resource experiments with the humans when they get there? Do you want them to pick up samples? How are you going to handle? The material on the NEO, is it, is it going to be small particles? Is it going to be dust? How are you going to gather it? What size, you know, what size of pieces do you want? And so you need to gather some information about these types of questions so you then can design, again, the, the parameters for the humans for when they get there. And you can, again, read the measurements that we came up with. And then uh, in summary, um, most, of the, most of the input was driven by what are the physical characteristics and the environmental characteristics of the NEO so we can do this smart design of both the mission and the tools and everything kept coming back to that, the composition, the structure, the integrity of the structure uh, in addition to the target. Um, 
we identified that there was some concern that it, it's a little, we're doing a little bit of circular chicken and egg thing here because we're trying to define what we're going to do at a NEO. We really need to talk about the, uh, the bigger picture uh, in order to prioritize what we need to focus on. So there was uh, a laundry list that we can create, but there still needs to be some prioritization there. And then there was also some discussion that came up that was very lively about what is the minimum amount of knowledge that you need to have from a precursor in order to send a, a human there? What level of knowledge will we feel comfortable with before we can say, okay, that's enough. We have enough flexibility in what humans can do. We have enough flexibility in our systems to get there. And so that's another discussion that we feel uh, probably needs to be undertaken in order to define a little bit more what the precursors can do. So I'm going to stop there, and hopefully we gave you something to think about, and we'd be happy to take some questions. <laughs> And I'm going to sit down, and then we can just sure. answer. Is this the protocol? Come to mind. Affirmative. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm David Morris from NASA Ames. Um, from the science point of view, we very much want to know just not only the surface properties, but the interior structure. From a defense point of view, interior structure may be important. I wasn't clear whether it really was necessary in a precursor for for humans to go there. Do you really care that much about the internal structure of the object? Uh, from that perspective. And I think one of you put it as fairly high priority and the other maybe less. From the standpoint of structural integrity and being able to manipulate the, the NEO, to interact with it, to tether to it, to dock with it, it you know, it, its uh, stability in, in the sense of perturbation really does come down to a hazards issue. And so the exact type of measurement uh, with respect to the internal structure may be different between if your objective is to understand how it was formed versus how to blow it up or deflect it versus uh, just trying to keep it together so you don't injure yourself. Um, and so, yeah, in turn, it, structural integrity is very important, but which flavor can guide exactly which types of measurements that you're going to be making toward that end. Uh, it, and actually, I really like the fact that you asked that question because we get into that on a regular basis between the nature of really, really expensive instruments such as a $45 million hyperspectral imager versus what we can attempt to attain on an X-Scout. Um, it's easy to say that we need imaging across the board and science historically has a need for exquisite measurements with exquisite instruments and very complicated trying to eke out as much performance as they possibly can within the kilograms that are allocated and within the dollar that's available. For engineering measurements though, the need for resolution or signal to noise ratio or things of that nature is not necessarily as high as if you're trying to do this broad characterization. And, and so that similar to the question that you were asking with respect to structural integrity, the, there's a differentiation with respect to, even though we're talking about imaging or sounding imaging SAR or uh, spectral imaging or something of that nature, there's a difference between the, the flavor of the measurements which can enable uh, ESMD uh, precursor missions to get by with less than exquisite instruments. You know, I just follow up to say, you know, as Jay was saying, you, you find the minimum you need uh, to measure to send the humans there, and while they're there, they can do some further, more detailed measurements for you in the other areas that you're interested in that you couldn't get because maybe you didn't need them for the robotic pre precursor. Um, well, actually, is this? Yeah. Um, actually, the question that uh, just came up really is, is interesting in the fact that y you mentioned you were looking at precursor objectives for what do we, what knowledge do we need to have before we send humans. Yesterday when we were talking about what are the objectives for going to NEOs, there were different classes. For example, do I want to go to a NEO to understand it from a, uh, a protection from Earth or from a science or, you know, preparing for other destinations. So it may be very interesting to put those questions on the table instead of just saying 
what knowledge base do we need before we send humans, if you look at it from those particular objectives, you may come up with a different suite of measurement needs or a different priority. In, in fact, we deliberately tied the, uh, the knowledge gap to the human objective when we got into sessions. Now, clearly that didn't come through very well with, with the outbrief that I gave. But one of the predominant things is that irrespective of the specific human objective, a lot of the precursor objectives have the one point of commonality that a human being is there and needs to be in proximity and perhaps touch the object. Irrespective of their uh, purpose being uh, drilling core samples for uh, a scientific objective or doing seismic measurements for a planetary defense objective or, prepare, or, or doing surveying for an ISRU objective. And so most of the precursor measurements that we're looking at are just the ability to get there safely and to uh, operate in that environment and to touch it safely. We did have some that were, in fact, correlated only to, if you make the assumption that the human objective is to conduct ISRU, then precursor prospecting could be an objective for precursors. But if the objective is for human beings to do prospecting, then the precursor really doesn't need to do the prospecting. You know, I, I have a follow-on uh, corollary question to that is you, you, you talked about your prioritization, your laundry list, but did you develop uh, in your group a criteria for NEO mission selection that goes beyond the objectives and requirements to the phasing and the readiness and the, and, and the broad, you know, beyond the physical and environmental attributes? Did you, did you discuss that or did you have a loose amalgam that came out of that? We, didn't, we did not explicitly get into the limits or the requirements. We didn't, uh, we, there was some discussion as to what is the maximum spin rate and we parked that one very quickly. The objective was is what are the measurements that we would have to take, not to identify what are the thresholds of those measurements. Okay, and I think that'd probably be a good example of forward work uh, mm -hmm. out, out of your group that's a, a vital need. Um, why don't we go in, in the back next and then Pete, you. I know you didn't have a lot of time um, to put up uh, your presentation, but I just wanted to put a note of caution, make sure that um, when we're talking about measurements, we're talking about the measurements, not the implementation. And I, and I just saw in, in your presentation, there's like, the measurement is APXS. The measurement's not APXS. The measurement is mineralogy or elemental chemistry. And I, I just wanna make sure we don't overly constrain the mission before we even know what the mission's gonna do. Thank you for that caution. And uh, yeah, we actually had a little bit of a discussion of that at the beginning of ours as well. Um, it started out that some of the measurements were very, very broad. Uh, and of course, it's a multiple tiered thing. Uh, characterization of the internal structure. Well, is that a measurement? Uh, so we wanted to get some level of, of, of specificity, including, I guess, may, perhaps too far into specificity, but to get the candidate type instruments just to affect the thinking. Uh, when you're talking about structural integrity, what do you mean? And then that's where we came up with the laundry list of, oh, well, a ground penetrating radar, a sounding imaging SAR, a, a uh, penetrating probe, uh, impactor, you know, these various things. Just, it, it is, a, in fact, a laundry list, but it does help characterize the nature of the measurement. I wanted to just, uh, because I haven't heard any discussion on this, a lot of times when NASA sends a mission to a, a distant body, uh, looking for possible signs of life comes up. And I wonder, is that something that uh, you would think about in terms of the instruments you would put there? Is that something you would need to know before you send humans there, before you plan to do planetary defense techniques there? Is it, did that come up on, at all in your discussion? It didn't come up in our discussion, but I think it goes back to how you characterize the environment you're going to be in and what's the probability that there could be signs of life there or life could have been created there. And then if it looks like maybe it's probably you could potentially add instruments to the human mission. So it would go back to how, you, how much you want to characterize the NEO before you arrive. You want to add anything? David, can I 
Conley, I'm the NASA Planetary Protection Officer, and I can at least give you a viewpoint from planetary protection regarding the necessity f or the lack of necessity for characterizing an object prior to sending humans. Uh, even with Mars, we do not have a requirement to take samples back from Mars and analyze them for life before sending humans. The constraints of planetary protection are uh, somewhat independent, and so for purposes of looking at an, a NEO, there are no con operational constraints on what humans need to do. Thank you. David Morrison again, and I'm going to suggest a hypothesis. I don't necessarily believe in it, but I, I'd like your reaction. I care, the question is, what is truly the minimum amount of characterization we would need to do before sending a human mission, the first human mission? And if we sent a, a rendezvous spacecraft and, and got all the remote sensing you can imagine, spin rates, topography, mass, mass distribution, maybe use some, uh, some uh, electromagnetic sounding, but did not touch it, could we send a human to a place that we had not actually touched or landed on? That is definitely a wonderful forward work question. And actually that, that question did come up in our session, and uh, the answer was, yeah, we, we can, because humans are, are smart enough to know how to react in those kind of situations. You just kind of poke it a little, oh, it's going to fall apart. Okay, it's not messed with it anymore. So we, we did have that conversation, and there was a lot of discussion with parallels to Apollo and how we approached the moon. So that did come up. All kidding aside, we also had the conversation as well, and uh, we also came to the conclusion that human beings, astronauts, are smart. And, um, <laughs> and that uh, as they're approaching the object, if it is wildly spinning out of control, they'll have the sense to not try to dock. Um, that you know, we can send, you know, you can do a, a light touch with a pointy stick, and if it comes apart, you don't get closer. Uh, it's, it's the fundamental things of that nature. But then you come to, okay, the astronauts are safe. We've sent them out there on this extraordinarily expensive mission, and they've come close enough to know it's dangerous, and now they're going home. Have you met minimum mission success under those criteria? So it really comes down to then the risk of the investment and whether or not you need to do some minimum level of precursing just so that you can get that minimum level of investment return on the human mission. So, yeah, the bare minimum is very possibly nothing if you're willing to get there, see that it's dangerous, and go home. And that's probably not sufficient for minimum mission success criteria. It, right, and, and, but we didn't, you know, once we got through that, we realized that that is a spectrum, and then that gets back to my, my earlier, more glib answer of, yeah, that's a, a lot of forward work that we would have to engage in as to exactly what that threshold is. We have laundry lists, and, and, now, and we took a first cut as to whether or not we thought that the measurement was critical or if it was important or nice to have. A three-point scale is insufficient to really get your differentiation and prioritization, but this is the first step and then we can start developing some uh, potential instrument manifests and, and see whether or not this makes sense. And as I had indicated yesterday, we are planning on having the uh, objectives definition teams uh, to assist in the preparations for what do these precursor missions, what the payload has to be, what are those minimum measurements have to be. Um, it, it, one process uh, thing, I'd like to see if we could please also have the, uh, the facilitators for the precursor groups. Why don't you come on up and join the front table as well? I think that might even add uh, to the more uh, be fun. Rich, uh, richness of the response and nothing like uh, impromptu uh, public speaking for people who aren't planning. Uh, and we can get one more chair, not a problem. So yeah, why don't, why don't, why don't you come up because we still have about 28 minutes of, uh, of, of uh, of potential Q&A here, so uh, I, I know I have a couple questions and we have uh, two other peoples. Also would like to remind folks that uh, uh, our web friends can't, uh, can't hear us, uh, so as we do follow up uh, Q&A, make sure we gravitate back to a microphone so, uh, uh, so that they can all be inclusive. I'll slide down one. I can 
can leave. Yeah. If that'll help. Wait, right here. The government is called spread the boy. <laughs> okay, John, we're ready. Okay, Anna. Um, Who is first? I don't know. All right, we'll go with the front. Oh, okay. Um, I think this is related to a lot of the things you're discussing about. There, there's sort of a subtle point here I wanted to just ask about. Um, imagine there's a scenario where you know we've picked out a target, everything's beautiful, we've had a precursor and everything, and then all of a sudden we miss our launch window and we have to go to a backup target that we've never been to, but we have some feeling for maybe that we've characterized objects like it. At what, at what level do we have confidence about just going to something we've never been to whatsoever? Does there, I mean, this, I, think you've, I think you've been talking about this, but I just wondered. I mean, there, that is a possibility I could see because Money and time are going to be issues. Is this my yeah. We discussed in our meeting trying to understand extensibility or how, how comparative data is between the NEOs we visit and other NEOs to be able to make any kind of extrapolation like that. So that's on our list of things to understand. The other thing is, you know, within NASA we recognize often, especially on a development program uh, that's got new rockets, new vehicles, there might be delay. So. One of the things we've talked about with internal to the program is coming up with options to understand what are other NEO potentials should we have a delay on the first launch or something. So those are on our list. I won't say we've got an answer, but we understand that we've got to try to understand how to have options more than just pick one NEO to launch on one date, and then if we miss that, we're hosed up. So. Yeah, there was also a uh, discussion, I, I, probably every one of the, the tables uh, talked about this. Uh, one would be, or one issue that would uh, need to be addressed is, what kind of ground truthing do you need to do for any NEO that you go to robotically that would give you a higher confidence level that the remote sensing measurements that you make of other potential targets are going to tell you uh, what you need to know about it. Um, also, how uh, if you were to consider the scenario you were talking about, Bill, that if I missed the target, what's a reasonable about a t amount of time that I would want to have another launch opportunity? Is that a month? Is that a, a quarterly, you know, th uh, three or four times a year? And if that's the case, do we have enough uh, understanding of the NEO population uh, with the appropriate filters that we were talking about to say, do I have a real target? at this kind of sequence so that if I miss this window, I have another one ready and it's the right kind of target for us. I mean, just to follow up, I can see a scenario where we decide not to go to maybe the best possible near-Earth object because there's a second best target which also has a good backup within a, a good cadence for things. You know, so yeah. these are things we'll have to think about. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, this is Jürgen from DLR. I just wanted to um, put uh, another emphasis on how to link all these precursor activities to the human missions as such. You have mentioned a lot of uh, the extensive suit of instruments and measurements that you want to do um, in preparing for human missions. The question is, have you looked also in your discussions on timing aspects of those, in the meaning that which of these need to be done early enough in order to inform systems design, which of these more inform operations, operational aspects at the NEO, and I was wondering if this linkage has been done, and if not, obviously there's a suggestion to do so. Yes, that was part of what we did uh, in, in the session. We uh, tried to assess whether or not the measurement would be required in the next five years, in the next 10 years, or 15 years out, uh, just ahead of the 2025. And it was explicitly to, uh, to assess whether or not it would need to affect the engineering of the systems to carry the astronauts, or if it was something that would more affect the last minute operations, or target verifications, and so it, there's a range as to when these measurements would have to take place. The other thing I guess I want to point out is we've kind of done just a cursory first round, so we recognize we need to get the different communities, the requirements from the uh, planetary defense and the science, and try to map those back into what do, does the, uh, from a human launch standpoint, need to be done. And I think an open action for us is to go sit down with Johnson Space Center a little more and do a next round of trying to coalesce data and schedules a little bit. We, we just aren't there yet. So this is kind of a very cursory round one. So uh, your questions are more than all valid. It's just we're still early in the process, but we welcome the inputs. In, in 
we notice that, uh, and I think Jay brought it up earlier, was that because we had three criteria, you know, immediate, uh, from a sense of urgency, what do we need now? Critical, intermediate, and then it can wait. And most of them came up as a critical with a couple of intermediate with very few weights and all this. So we have to go refine our criteria now and go, go, go down to the next level and, you know, start subdividing even further than that. Uh, and it was just for the first, co first pass, and then we didn't have a whole lot of time to go back and refine those. Go ahead. Yeah, let me follow up on that comment. How specific were you in defining the criteria for developing your prioritizations? A very, very high level. Uh, criticality was, you know, high, medium, and low. So it, it's going to take it's going to take more work to uh, to to define exactly what what it is that we're going to be doing, and then what's the criticality for getting those precursors in place in time to affect the architecture. And, and Dave, remember the kind of process that we were using. We started off with, you know, basically the world of possibilities. Uh, and so one of the things you'd ask is, well, is this something that you, it's an absolute got to have uh, before we send humans, okay? So that's uh, a higher level of criticality. Uh, and, and on further discussion, some stuff would say, boy, this would be really nice to have, but it's not an absolute got to have, and so it just moved farther down the way. Yeah, and I guess what I'm asking is, how do you reach that judgment? And can you write down criteria that would allow you to recognize something as being more valuable than something else? And to some extent, this is an extension of the comments that were made by David Morrison a few minutes ago. Um, until you have those criteria, you can't defend uh, a, a set of judgments, you know, in an abstract way. You know, using David's example as, um, as, as a good example. And I, and I think what we've gone through in, the, in this process over the last couple of days is really telling us the kind of things we, uh, that we have to be doing in, in the future and some of the stuff in the very near future so that we can take better advantage of all of the information that came in uh, over the last couple of days. Yeah, and I, I guess so, what I would encourage you to do as you process the information from this point forward is um, set criteria like the impact on the reduction in cost of the yeah. mission, or the impact on the reduction in risk, yeah. or the impact in the increase in value yeah. of this, the eventual human mission, and then prioritize the long list of possibilities against those kinds of parameters, you know, and then the, the really valuable things will bubble up to the top. Yeah, in, in a two-hour session, starting from ground zero, the best we were really able to eke out is got to have it, really want it, and nice to have. Uh, but clearly, the, a more qualitative measurement would have to actually be made for decision making, but this helps guide us and it helps point us toward the right directions and where the, the, where the, uh, where the community is seeing things that are relatively important. It, it's, it's a top-level guide right now. It's not a, it's not a decision-making tool at this point. And, and pushing more on that vein of, of minimum and, and what, what we need and what we don't need, uh, did you look at, if we have the survey satellite telescope in Venus orbit, what is the maximum information we can get from that to allow us to go to backups or to use that as our only precursor? So how much information can we gain from that, from that telescope that would allow us to pick alternates? Did you look at a criteria like that? Yeah. Well, in, in fact, as the discussion uh, went on at, at our particular table, uh, we found out that that was uh, very strongly tied. Like, what, do you, what are you going to learn? What will be the, the net value of, of the survey mission is going to depend on what are those filters that you're using to say, we would not consider this object, but we would consider this one. And so having that discussion, uh, prior to the one that you're talking about allows, would allow you to define, first of all, what are the capabilities of a survey mission that you would want? And second of all, well, and directly related to that is, do you need it or do we know enough already? And, and then on the other side, how does that force us to expand the parameters of the human mission to handle all various situations based on where we end up going eventually? So you can kind of trade off, what do we sense? 
how much we allocate to the mission, human mission to go. I get a follow. I get a follow-up question uh, based upon Dallas's, and that is. So as we look at, uh, as you outlined, uh, the IR survey uh, mapping, as we look at, uh, you know, the Venus Trailing Telescope, what other options in terms of in space? Did you address any of, of the potential DOD, intelligence community, international, any commercial uh, sensors or capabilities, either in space situational awareness or space surveillance uh, network related uh, for, or, or ground-based assets? Uh, that could be further leveraged in terms of uh, characterization. I, I mean, if affordability is is a huge driver, I'm 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 like to probe on that a little bit. The way we tried to approach this right now was just trying to define the requirements of what do I think I need to know, and then the next round, as you start to formulate that and go through this priority and criteria ranking, though at some point is to start looking at the international partners and other assets. What we're trying to get on the first round, I think, is to understand exactly what it is we need to know so we can go do that, that study. Yeah. And, and I think we, uh, we actually captured it as a thought of things to do to make sure that we used uh, Earth-based and space-based assets uh, starting now, in fact. Uh, Faith brought that up as, as kind of when we spent about two minutes talking it because we were getting close to the end. but. Uh, realizing that there are a lot of valuable assets that we've already got in place, and now we ought to go survey those and see what we can use to help uh, uh, get through this and, and to start to start the work now without having to go through, a, you know, building a spacecraft or anything. So. I, I think that came up at all the tables, mostly yeah. focusing on what ground assets we could bring to bear. But, again, it was focused on what is it that we need to measure, and then secondarily, well, how do you make that measurement? Okay. Excellent. I, I, I tell you what, I'll... Uh, out of, okay, sure, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, as an astronomer, uh, I recognize that there's no telescope other than radar that's going to give you any of the physical information you want, not diameter, not mass, not anything. These are unbelievably small compared to anything that, uh, else that we look at. That's why we want to go with spacecraft. Um, I'll wait. Behind. Okay, I'd like yes. to address the value of a survey telescope. So, actually, you can get sizes. The question is, you know, obviously the radar measurements are more precise, but you can obtain a size measurement with, a, with an IR telescope. That's been well established. With WISE, we see objects as small as about 40 meters. So, one of the big values, I would say the zeroth order thing that a survey really does for you, is it allows you to constrain your delta V requirement, and it also supplies a target instead of one every few years, maybe one every few months, or even one a month. And that allows you to set your zeroth order mission parameters, so then you can start actually going off and developing your human spaceflight. The other thing it does for you is it does provide characterization data, so you get a size distribution, so you have, you have a measurement of the size. It's true, it's not as precise as a radar measurement, but it's not bad, it's pretty good. And it also gives you, if you combine it with visible data, an albedo which gives you sort of a handle on what it's made out of. You can also use the IR data to get uh, various thermophysical properties like thermal inertia and how strong non-gravitational forces are on a particular size of object. So there's a lot of ancillary value to it as well as just the zeroth order problem of being able to lay out your delta V requirements and your launch windows well in advance. Okay, thank you, Doug. You're Ready? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> boss, are you ready? <laughs> I know you're ready, um, boss. <laughs> you have the floor. <laughs> well, I know I'll get a chance to ask questions and, and make comments uh, from here on out. So I wanted to let others uh, talk first. But, um, and, and so I, but I did want to make a couple of comments and ask a couple of questions. Um, and maybe it'll, it'll stimulate further conversation even, um, because I, I have my own views on things and so others can, can, can comment on, on, on those. Um, in, term, I, in terms of um, what we use as filters to look at what's currently known, um, it would seem to me that we should open those up to un know what we're not looking at, if nothing else, so that if we can see anything else, it's interesting. So. Uh, that that is one aspect of this. In in terms of um, uh, things like what uh, uh, Dave Morrison and 
and uh, Dave Beatty um, uh, brought up. Um, in, term, in, in a lot of what discussion has happened already, it is important to understand what is it that we really need to know. Um, and it's not just, um, it's not just safety aspects. Um, ultimately, I think we need to address uh, what we need to know to understand the value of the mission itself. Um, and in my view, precursors help you uh, on the engineering parameters. We talked about safety aspects and whether the thing is spinning or dust characteristics. Uh, there's only so much of that that is of primary importance, possibly. Uh, the more you know, the better you are. But basically, uh, you don't want to go to an object that's probably spinning to the point where you can't do anything with it. Um, uh, but some of the lower level measurements and that sort of thing, you design for. Uh, you design for uncertainties. So um, at what level are you willing to accept the variation? Uh, so I, I think it will be important that we develop criteria that's very, um, very precise uh, in terms of what we're willing to accept. And that probably needs to be done before we go to uh, an ODT. Um, we, need, we need specific guidance on, on what we think we really need to know. Uh, in terms of a survey mission, um, I, I understand the interest in finding more objects. Um, I do think um, finding, um, having some good ones to pick from are, are important. Characterizing them to me seems more important uh, if you have enough to pick from. Uh, to go, uh, if, if we don't, um, say if, uh, I, I, I wonder a little bit about the, um, the value um, of spending a whole lot of money looking for something that's not there. Uh, or may not be there. I know there are a lot of these um, near-Earth objects out there, but, but if we're just going to do surveys to try to find something we have no idea whether it's there or not, then, then is that something we want to do? That's a question. I, that'll, that'll probably draw a comment. Um, <laughs> um, on the, and this one may too. Um, on the subject of, of, of ISRU, um, is there, is there even a possibility of doing anything meaningful with ISRU? And Jerry would probably would like to comment on that. But uh, <laughs> um, if, if, uh, is it a misconception that we can't get to these very often? If we can't get to them very often, we can only go for a short period of time, is ISRU very realistic? That's a question. Um, so that, I'll, I'll leave with that. <laughs> okay, we'll take the first one, which was uh, characterization uh, versus surveys. Uh, you want to dive into that? Someone? Well, I, I think that Doug was uh, voicing an awful lot of the discussion that occurred in the groups. And I, and I think that uh, a more uh, pointed discussion about this as to what you really need uh, and how you're going to potentially lay out both ro robotic as well as, as human missions, um, I think that's a, a, a good point of discussion and, and better sooner rather than later. It really does come down to the pushing on those filters. Yeah. It really does. Uh, if we've got uh, several dozen options to choose from, there's an, we're not going to be precursing at several dozen, so we have more than enough. Um, but if the filters say that we have exactly one option every 11 years, that's probably an untenable, it's un, it seems to be an unsustainable architecture. And so, well, do we need a survey mission in order to fill those gaps? Well, we have ground uh, assets, we have other space-based assets, we have other folks making observations, uh, international participants, we don't necessarily need to do it. Uh, SMD has a charter to count NEOs. Uh, planetary defense has a, an, a strong interest in, in such a, a telescope. If, in fact, we have a targeting problem, if the filters you know, indicate that we don't have very many options, then, then we have a need to find targets. There's an overlap. 
uh, in, in terms of need. And so when it then comes to the who's the responsible party, is there a way to collaborate together in order to, to meet a common objective? It's a, it's a broad discussion that needs to be had. And we're, we're engaging that conversation. Okay, we'll put that in the forward work box too because yep. that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, in, in the interest of uh, lightning around, uh, on, that, on that any other topic, uh, or on that topic, is there anyone else uh, from our audience that wanted to uh, throw out a couple of nuggets on that uh, on, on that topic, I think we've heard we've heard we've heard from our team leads in our in our group. Any, any, any since that's a fairly fundamental question, go ahead. Uh, yes, we have a, a yes. We'll find a lot more if we look with the right sorts of instruments. I think that's the that's we we yesterday we had a discussion of of the completeness of our surveys and. Obviously, our surveys are not very complete once you get down below a kilometer in diameter. And for the small guys, we're going to find a lot more if we look with the right sorts of instruments from the right place. This, this orbit on Earth is not the right place to look. And so we've just looked here because the, because the light is better here, because it's easier to do. Um, the other thing is that, that for characterization, because finding them, identifying them is just, just just half of the, the issue. The other, the, other, the other part of it is characterizing them, getting reflectance spectroscopy, getting spin rate, getting, getting thermal data. And um, right now, the spin state is being done by amateurs with telescopes that are this big. If we have a, a small guy who's a rapid rotator, we're going to need a much bigger instrument in order to get that kind of spin state. And so really, you're talking about priorities on telescopes. The telescopes exist for that kind of characterization right now. We just don't get priority on them. And we need to, we need to reorganize the priorities. Okay. Any other, uh, any other lightning round input? Go, go ahead. Uh, yes? Oh, we still have time in this session. I was just trying to fire through the, uh, the, the two questions that Doug posed. That was question number one. Uh, go ahead. I'm Josh Hopkins from Lockheed Martin. I just wanted to, to reiterate the support in the audience, I think, for a survey mission and, and point out that even if we have a number of targets already, we know that the, the, the tenth of a percent that are the most accessible are a lot more accessible than the, you know, even the 99th percentile ones. So the, uh, although I'm sensitive to this question of who should pay for it, is it ESMD or SMD, I, I firmly believe that ESMD will save money on a human mission by spending the money on a survey telescope because the cost savings of making that mission that much easier is really substantial. And it also plays into things like finding an asteroid with a shorter trip time is a substantial safety benefit from things like radiation and just mission duration risk. So I, I think the survey telescope is a, a high priority item to do early. It also works as a precursor to the, uh, the, the flyby or rendezvous missions because for instance, if you, if you find 10 times more asteroids than we know now, it's a lot easier to put together a grand tour that, that visits multiple objects, which is going to be important for characterizing a broad population. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that? Yeah, just, go ahead. I was going to say something. Is it, um, it depends a lot on the filters we decide to apply and what we think is important. I mean, to me, just at a fundamental level, and I know there's all this issue of politics and who's going to pay and all the rest, but we're talking about spending hundreds of billions of dollars, and we're not going to spend hundreds of millions to go look to see what the population is like before we go? That seems strange to me. Um, beyond that, I think that, you know, asteroids are a very diverse collection of objects, right? We have, we've named all the different characteristics they have, fast spinners, slow spinners, monoliths, ro robopiles. Water rich, iron rich, stony, you know, different kinds of stony, some differentiated, some not. You can go on and on and on. We want to hit the sweet spot of all those things and do something that's really worthy of spending hundreds of billions of dollars for the taxpayer. So you want to get the best asteroid you can. If the goal is just to go there and touch it to say we touched it, okay, then maybe the target doesn't matter. Maybe most of this what we're talking about doesn't matter. But I think if you want to do something interesting that's worthy of the program, I think you want to do a survey first. Somewhere, somewhere, someone's got to pay for it. Okay, copy. We got uh, three and a half minutes left, so I'll go to quickly to the uh, next question number two. Then we'll open it back up to the floor, and that is uh, talking ISRU, the utility, looking at the value proposition uh, for a neo 
uh, or not in the overall affordability trade space. Jerry. Okay. Um, yeah, just very quickly, um, I jotted down some notes. It goes back to the big question as to what the purpose of the human mission to NEOs is. And, you know, from a first blush, if you're trying to enable the mission, you're not going to use ISRU to get there or to return. Um, it may be extra radiation shielding if you find part of the way through that you had to do that, great. Um, however, there may be things that you want to do on a human mission or a precursor with respect to either mitigation strategies. If you actually have to move an asteroid, using the resources of the asteroid to move it, whether it's a mass driver or volatiles or something like that, may be worth considering. Or if you wanted to move the asset closer to Earth from a, a economic point of view, that might be something that to, to consider. Um, the other item that, that comes up is when we talked about synergies, um, is there synergy between NEOs and, say, Phobos, such that you might want to set up a propellant depot uh, in Mars orbit using Phobos as, as, a, as a resource? You might do something on a NEO mission along those lines. Um, and then in general, the last comment is typically a lot of the science and prospecting aspects um, are very similar. So even if you don't do an ISRU demo of, of uh, per se, uh, understanding the minerals, understanding the volatiles, understanding the material aspects such that I can plan a mining aspect if I want to. And if we want to go beyond Mars into the main asteroid belt, um, obviously there would be things that we would learn on a NEO mission that, that uh, uh, would be used there. So bottom line, if you're thinking of using ISRU to enable a human NEO mission, no. That, doesn't make a lot of sense because that typically requires you to preposition. But if you want to eventually use that knowledge for mitigation or economic or for Mars exploration, there may be, you know, some subscale activities that you would do on the human NEO mission or robotics that may make sense. And so it's open for discussion and debate. Copy. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, any others? Uh, quick lightning comment on ISRU? Yep. Yes, uh, this addresses, ties the ISRU with the, uh, with the robotic precursor doing a survey mission. In the policy group, and the policy group I was part of, the uh, team seemed to come to the conclusion that was reported out yesterday that a level zero requirement for why we're doing this, addressing it from a policy perspective, was about um, the economic growth potential of these objects as well as protecting the plant, you know, humanity from uh, the impact. And if that is your level two requirement, I mean level zero or level one requirement of why we're doing this, then that totally changes your perspective of why you do that uh, robotic, that uh, survey mission. Because you want to discover all the ones that might impact the earth on one hand from the planetary protection or planetary defense. And you also having a survey map of a resources of the solar system of the, of the near-Earth objects becomes very critical because it's the smaller ones, which is the smaller delta V and a much higher population, which are the valuable ones. And so that gives you a, a, a real justification why you would do that. And then that drives into the ISRU because you're going to want to know how to utilize those resources from an economic perspective. So thank you. Okay, great. Final question, sir. You get it. Yeah, lightning round, though. Lightning question, lightning answers. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a comment about the uh, survey, uh, filling in the survey with ground-based assets. The, uh, the objects that we're most interested in are the low delta V ones, and they're the ones that are moving most slowly relative to Earth. So if you think of two cars on a racetrack going almost the same speed, they pass each other very, very infrequently. And the objects we're talking about are so faint, they have to be close to the Earth in order to be discovered from the Earth. And so uh, the, the advantage of the Venus orbit is that you're lapping the, all those objects in a very short time. So you, you really cannot do the survey even with very good assets that are Earth-bound or in Earth, Earth orbit. Okay. Well, um, that was a very robust and rich uh, cross-com session, so thank you very much. What I would like to uh, give folks a little heads up on is one for the team leads and uh, and facilitators up here. Um, 
What we are hoping to do is we're hoping to capture each of the, uh, you know, we've had people recording both the questions and, and, and the answers, uh, both uh, on audiovisual as well as uh, in note taking. But what we'd also like for you, and this is kind of setting the tone for the rest of the afternoon as well, to uh, take some of these ideas. We are going to, again, as, we, as, I, as I mentioned previously, we're going to uh, look at doing uh, uh, some, some knowledge capture here and doing those, those reports and presentations. Make sure you, you, you jot that down while it's still fresh, and, uh, and, and we'll merge all that together. And that's, uh, that's a little advance warning for, uh, uh, for the afternoon. So with that, we are, we are exactly on time for this morning. I applaud you. I think that was a uh, very robust, uh, well-led, um, well, well integrated and sync session. So thank you. Uh, we are now going to adjourn for one hour, uh, actually 58 minutes, and uh, we will be back starting promptly at one o'clock. And uh, you are again on your own for lunch. We will do all this in the afternoon. Thank you very much.